answer. What comfort is it to you that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? In all my sorrow and persecution, I lift up my head and eagerly await as judge from heaven the very same person who before has submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake and has removed all the curse from me. He will cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation, but he will take me and all his chosen ones to himself into heavenly joy and glory. And the scripture that we'll be considering tonight comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3. If you have Bibles, you can turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, or else the text will be projected above me, and you can read it there. Philippians chapter 3, and we're just going to read verses 20 and 21. Philippians 3. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead. This is one of those key articles in the Apostles' Creed, a very foundational doctrine, so important for all of us as Christian believers to affirm, Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead. I want to ask you tonight, is this good news? When you think of the good news of Christianity, do you think of this line, he will come to judge the living and the dead? Is it enjoyable to meet with a judge? Well, it all depends on whether you're guilty. Do you believe that you're guilty before God tonight? Do you believe that you love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? If you're like me, I believe I'm guilty of failing to love God as I ought and, and uh, negligent of loving my neighbor as I ought. I remember being a young boy, I was raised in a Christian family, I was exposed to biblical teaching, being quite fearful of the return of Jesus. I had images in my mind that were informed by Scripture. You could think, for example, of what John says in Revelation 1-7, he will come on the clouds and every eye will see him. And if there was ever some kind of weird cloud formation in the sky, I would think, uh-oh, Jesus could be returning, and I don't know if I'm quite prepared to meet him yet. How do you feel about the return of Jesus to judge the living and the dead? I find it quite interesting that in the Bible, the return of Jesus is often presented as good news, often presented as something to which believers should, should look forward to. And this is something we find in our text tonight, in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, where the Apostle Paul says, we eagerly await from heaven a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's language that the Heidelberg Catechism, in fact, borrows in the very answer that we read together a moment ago. We eagerly await from heaven the very same person who has experienced the judgment of God in my place. In fact, the Heidelberg Catechism says, in all of my sorrow and persecution, I lift up my head and eagerly await the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the time when the Heidelberg Catechism was written, a lot of people were experiencing sorrows and persecutions. Life expectancy was not very high. Protestant Christians, and for that matter, Christians of other stripes, experienced a lot of persecution. Some of you might be familiar with the name Martin Luther, a prominent 
reformer from the time of the Reformation. He had to hide for eight months in the Wartburg Castle. Caspar Livianus, who's one of the authors of the Heidelberg Catechism, spent time in prison. Zacharias or Sinus, the other author of the Catechism, had to flee his hometown. These were people who experienced a lot of sorrow and a lot of persecution. And for them, part of the good news was the return of Jesus, and they could lift up their head and look forward to his return. I wonder tonight how often you think about the return of Jesus and how meaningful that is for you. If I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think about it often enough. Why is it that I don't think often about the return of Jesus? And why is it that perhaps you don't think often of the return of Jesus? Well, I suggest that it's because we live in a very decadent society. We live in a society where there's very little overt persecution. We live in a society of abundance. We live in a society where life expectancy is quite high, where we have hospitals to care for us when we're sick all kinds of people to attend to us when we experience problems. And so our minds often don't go to the good news of Jesus' return. And yet when you read the Bible, you discover that the return of Jesus is a very important event. In fact, every single book in the New Testament refers to the second coming of Christ. In fact, the return of Christ is the completing work of Christ. It's what crowns all of his work because Jesus is the one through whom the whole world was made. Jesus is the one through whom the whole world is redeemed. And Jesus is the one through whom the whole world will be restored. At the very beginning, he created this this pure creation. And in the end, he will have once again a pure creation. It's the crowning work, we could say, of the work of Christ. And so it is important for us to pay attention to the return of Jesus. And in the time we have together, it won't be that long, I want to pay attention to three things. The nature of Christ's return, the timing of Christ's return, and the promise of Christ's return. Let's begin with the nature of Christ's return. In the year 1932, there was a large number of Presbyterian ministers who signed what was called the Auburn Affirmation, in which they said that the visible bodily return of Jesus is just a theory. And I want tonight to disabuse you of any such notion, and I want to claim that, in fact, the return of Jesus is personal, visible, and glorious, and I'm not going to spend much time on them. We'll go through these three things very quickly so we can spend more time on other things tonight. But it is, first of all, personal. It's not a metaphor for something. Jesus himself will return personally. And if you remember the account of his ascension into heaven as it's narrated in Acts 1, you have these two men dressed in white, presumably angels, who say to the disciples, this same Jesus who was taken up into heaven will return in the same way you saw him leave. Jesus will return personally. Secondly, Jesus will return visibly. This is accented in numerous texts in the New Testament. One of them I already mentioned, Revelation 1-7, where John says, Jesus will come on the clouds and every eye will see him. It is a personal and visible return. And then... Thirdly, it is a glorious return. Jesus, of course, over the course of his life, suffered immensely. His suffering culminated with his crucifixion. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 2 says that when Jesus died on the cross, he was emptying himself. He was pouring himself out as a sacrifice. He was made a nobody. He took on the form of a bondservant. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross, abject humiliation, but then he is glorified. He is risen and ascended. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's reigning over everything, but the full glory of Jesus will not be apparent until his return. Numerous passages speak about the return of Jesus in glory. Titus 2 verse 13 is among of them. Speaks of our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Well, let's now move on to the timing of Christ's return. And there are a number of passages that suggest that Jesus is going to return soon. In fact, Jesus himself in Revelation 22 says, I am coming soon. You can find numerous passages in the New Testament that seem to suggest that Jesus was going to return in the lifetime of the apostles. There are also passages that suggest that the return of Jesus is going to be delayed, that it's going to be a long ways off, and there are parables about this. You could think, for example, of the parable of the ten virgins, where we have a line about this, about the bridegroom. Jesus says, this is Matthew 25, the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. This is a parable about the return of Jesus that suggests that it will be a long way off and that in the course of the delay of the return, people will become drowsy, which is why you often have a summons in the New Testament to be watchful and awake and vigilant because Jesus is returning. And then there's a whole host of passages which make clear that we don't know when Jesus will return. Mark 13, 32, but about that day or hour, this is Jesus himself speaking, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Well, how do we put all of this together? What do we make of those passages that seem to suggest that Jesus is coming soon? You might know tonight that there's a whole host of Bible scholars who believe that Jesus and the apostles were, were mistaken and thought that the return would happen sooner than it did. There's one uh, famous New Testament uh, scholar by the name of C.H. Dodd who believes that the apostle Paul changed his mind three times about this. And if you read the earlier letters, 1 Corinthians, he seems to think that Jesus will return in his lifetime, by the time you get to 2 Corinthians, he's a little ambiguous, and by the time you get to Philippians, he's quite sure he's going to die before Jesus returns. Well, I'm not sure that the apostles were wrong or that the apostles changed their mind, but then how do we make sense of those passages that speak about the nearness of the return of Jesus? Well, here's how I think we should understand them that every significant event in the life of Jesus has already occurred, his incarnation, his becoming human, his death on the cross, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, every significant event has already occurred but one, and that's his return. And so if you think of the progress of redemption as train stops, stops for the train, there's only one stop left, only one significant thing for Jesus still to do, and that's for him to return. So the return of Jesus is near in that sense that we're not expecting anything significant to happen in terms of the work of Christ before he returns. Now, what is the significance of us not knowing the day or the time? You should know that there have always been Christians, it seems, who predicted the return of Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses have done this several times. And if you knew when Jesus would return, it would change how you lived, right? If you knew Jesus was going to return this coming Wednesday, it would probably affect what you did Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. For example, I would not cut the grass. I would not pull any weeds. I would not go to the gym. I really don't go to the gym anyhow, so <laughs> no big difference there. I don't pull weeds either, come to think of it. Um, but what we find is that not knowing when Jesus will return, far from Eliminating responsibility actually elevates responsibility. And I want to read to you from Romans 13, where the Apostle Paul makes exactly that point. Listen to this. This is a passage, by the way, that speaks of the return of Jesus as something imminent and soon, but notice how Paul frames it. And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come 
for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed, which is always true. It's nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Not knowing the day or hour, but knowing that the return of Jesus is nearer now than when we first believe. Far from eliminating responsibility, in fact, elevates responsibility. Now, before we move on, I want to engage one other passage in Scripture about this where you had people who were mocking Christians because Jesus was not returning. And you may have had Christians in the early church who were expecting Jesus to return in their lifetime, and they began to be mocked. We find this in 2 Peter 3. Listen to these words. Peter writing to the churches in Asia Minor. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? I suspect there are people today making that express mockery. Jesus said he would return. It's now 2,000 years. He hasn't come. Where is this coming that Jesus is talking about? Listen to how the Apostle Peter responds. He says, verse 6, verse 8 rather, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, isn't that the most humbling thing you could ever read? It turns out there's a reason why Jesus has not returned yet. And it's not because God is not fulfilling his promises. It's not because God is negligent at keeping his promises. There's an express reason given in the text for the delay of Jesus' return, and it's this, to give you and me and all people everywhere opportunity to repent. Because God is patient and long-suffering, not wanting anyone to perish. God, as Ezekiel says, does not delight in the death of the wicked, but that everyone should come to him in repentance, and he's delaying his return to give more people in more places opportunity to repent. And of course, this underscores for us, doesn't doesn't it, the urgency of gospel preaching and the whole enterprise of evangelism. Let's move lastly to the promise of Christ's return. And what we discover in the New Testament is that the return of Jesus is not first and foremost, about comforting believers. This is my one quibble with the catechism's answer, which is always interpreting the events of Jesus in terms of their significance for us, but sometimes missing the more cosmic dimensions of these events. And if you look up every single passage in the New Testament that talks about the return of Jesus, what you discover is that the return of Jesus is significant especially because it reveals the triumph and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in our text, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. He is the one who has the power to bring everything everything under his control. And when Jesus returns, what is presently unseen will become visible. What we presently know by faith shall be seen, namely that Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, that he is the glorious, reigning, 
triumphant king, that he is the one before whom every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. The return of Jesus is first and foremost the revelation, the publication, the revealing of his victory and of his glory. Secondly, the return of Jesus means judgment for evildoers. Listen to what Paul says, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 and 8. Very grim words, I think. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is patient, not wanting any to perish, giving many people opportunity for repentance, but there is apparently a time when his patience is exhausted and when he will return in judgment and evildoers and evil will be punished. Now, we shouldn't think of the punishment of evildoers as something arbitrary. You have in the world today people who choose to ignore God and live as they please. And the frightening reality of punishment for evil is that God will give people their wish. Which is to say, if you choose to live apart from God, if you choose to live out your own desires and your own ambitions, God will let you have your way. It's a little bit along the lines of what C.S. Lewis says, you know, that the door to hell is closed from the inside and not from the outside because it's people choosing the very destiny that they now experience. But the other side to this is that there is going to be justice that's meted out. And there are all kinds of crimes, horrible crimes committed in the world today, crimes that are being committed today in Ukraine, for example, war crimes. Where is the justice for those who've suffered injustice? God is a God of justice. He will mete out justice in the end. But what about you and me? We will have to give an account of every idle word spoken. Well, that brings us to the hope of believers, doesn't it? Titus 2.13, we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The ultimate hope for believers, the ultimate redemption, the ultimate liberation, the ultimate transformation is not to be found in some kind of political ideology, whether communism or socialism or conservatism or liberationism. Libertarianism. The ultimate redemptive force is not to be located in some political party, liberal, conservative, new democrat, green. The ultimate redemption is not going to be brought about by one particular denomination or one particular institution or one particular psychology or some kind of technology. There's ultimately only one hope for people in this broken world, and it is this. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. Jesus then will defeat all of his and our enemies, and the last enemy is death itself. Clearly and obviously, the one problem that humanity cannot resolve, the problem of death itself. I don't want to spend much time on that because Pastor Greg and I are preaching on 1 Corinthians 15 all about the resurrection. I want to conclude with thinking a little bit about God as judge. Now, I said at the very beginning, didn't I, that it's not necessarily something enjoyable to appear before a judge when you are guilty. And if we have any honesty and integrity tonight, we must admit 
our guilt. We do not love God as we should, not with heart, soul, mind, and strength. We do not love our neighbors as we ought. It is the one thing that is fundamentally, unequivocally, uncontestably true for all of us tonight, and that is we are all guilty, all guilty before the face of God. How can we face Jesus as judge when he will have us give an account of every idle word we have spoken? Well, here I think the catechism is so helpful when it reminds us that the judge that we will appear before is the very same Savior who died for us. He doesn't need to be bribed because he's already paid the price. And we then will plead as we do today in our prayers, the blood of Jesus. And we will say, I have no argument, I have no case, I have no defense, but the blood of Jesus. And Jesus will show his hands and his side and the scars of the crucifixion because the judge we meet is the Savior who died for us. Pastor Greg thinks he's going to win this contest of long quotes. He's not. This is John Calvin. Listen, this here are such beautiful, beautiful words. John Calvin, Protestant reformer. I'll conclude with this. How many times will I say I'll conclude with this? But just a few remarks after this conclusion, then a real conclusion. Listen to these wonderful words. Hence arises a wonderful consolation that we perceive judgment to be in the hands of him who has already destined us to share with him the honor of judging. Far indeed is he from mounting his judgment seat to condemn us. How could our most merciful ruler destroy his people? How could the head scatter his own members? How could our advocate condemn his clients? For if the apostle dares exclaim that with Christ interceding for us, there is no one who can come forth to condemn us, it is much more true than that Christ as intercessor will not condemn those whom he has received into his charge and protection. No mean assurance this, that we shall be brought before no other judgment seat than that of our Redeemer, to whom we must look for our salvation. Moreover, he who now promises eternal blessedness through the gospel will then fulfill his promise in judgment. Therefore, by giving all judgment to the Son, the Father has honored him to the end that he may care for the consciences of his people who tremble in dread of judgment. Isn't that amazing? It's up there with the John Updike poem, I think. So the return of Jesus is mentioned in every book of the New Testament. It is the crowning work of Christ. It is something that ought to have our attention. We've seen the nature. It is personal, visible, and glorious. We've seen the timing, in some sense, soon. The next big event and the sequence of things that Jesus does, it is delayed to give all of us opportunity to repent, and the precise time is unknown. And thirdly, when Jesus returns, it will be the revelation of his triumph and his kingship and his authority and glory. It will be the judgment on evil and on evildoers, and it will be the great hope for Christian believers, the ultimate salvation, liberation, redemption, the ultimate defeat of our greatest enemies, including death itself. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for his incarnation, his life, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his session at your right hand, and for his return. And even though, Father, we anticipate trembling, 
at the moment when Jesus returns and we see him face to face, we know from your word that it will be a moment of rejoicing because the very same person who appears before us as judge is the one who died for us. And our consciences are put into his tender hands, there to be relieved. We pray that you would form in our hearts and minds a great awareness and desire for the return of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.